Hi, and welcome back. Let's start by wondering why we need attack and release controls at all. I'm going to explain that with a sine wave at 200 Hz, which gives us a steady signal level just below the threshold. But of course, the sine wave is not really a steady signal. In reality, it oscillates from positive to negative and back again 200 times a second. If the compressor reacted instantly to only the peaks of the waveform, the result would be severe distortion, with our sine wave starting to look more like a square wave. So let's see what happens if I suddenly boost the signal level above the threshold. And we can see on the graph that the gain reduction is smoothed out and applied gradually. And if the signal suddenly drops back down below the threshold, the gain rides back up smoothly as well. This smoothing means the compressor can turn down the volume of the sine wave without distorting it beyond all recognition. But if we look at the resulting waveform, we can see a blip at the start of the loud section, where the attack stage of the compression kicks in, and a dip after the end of the loud section as the release stage ramps the gain back up to unity. It's these bits where all the action happens. The attack stage changes the shape of the waveform briefly as it rides the gain down. And the release stage changes it again as it rides the gain back up again. Of course, most real-world signals don't behave like a sine wave test tone. So unless you're compressing an organ part, chances are the compressor will be either attacking or releasing whenever the signal is above the threshold. So let's try a more interesting example. Drums are about as far away from a steady state signal as you can get, and are a great way to hear the effects of compression. In this case, I'm processing a subgroup of an otherwise fully mixed drum kit, but with all compressors turned off. Working with Pro C2's default settings, I'm going to start by turning the knee down to zero again, to make the knee of the graph sharper and the compression more aggressive. I'll turn the ratio all the way up again, and set the fastest possible attack time to catch those fast transients at the start of each drum hit. I'm also going to switch to the punch compression style, which is often a good choice for drums. And now I'll adjust the threshold until we're seeing about 12 to 15 dB of gain reduction on the meters. This is too much, but you're going to have to apply too much compression while learning to use it and training your ears to hear the effects. So don't be afraid to really smash things hard to start with. When using fast compression settings and processing audio with lots of high frequency content like this, it will usually sound a bit better if you enable oversampling at the bottom. But I'm not going to go into the reasons for that here, just take my word for it for now. Let's take a look at the level meters to the right. These allow us to compare input levels to output levels. But notice that both meters display two different readouts. The higher, darker bar shows peak levels, which tells us how much headroom we've got left before the red clip lights come on. The lower, brighter bar is more interesting most of the time, as this shows average levels, which correlate much better with perceived loudness. There isn't much difference between input and output levels right now, as we've got auto gain turned on, which attempts to automatically set the output gain to compensate for the current compressor setting. This is only an estimate, so usually needs a bit of manual tweaking to get it just right. If I turn off auto gain, we see the actual effect of the compression. And I need to dial in manual makeup gain of around 10 dB to match the average levels of input and output. Notice that when average levels are roughly matched, the peak levels of the output are still a little lower than the input. So the compression is slightly reducing the difference between peak and average level. Now let's try adjusting the release time. With the shortest, fastest setting, things start to sound a little unnatural. The body and tail of the snare is now almost the same level as the initial transient, and it sounds more like a burst of noise than a real drum. If we go to the other extreme, the drums sound much more natural and less processed, and the average levels drop as the gain is held down for much longer after each hit. In fact, the release is too slow to ever fully recover between hits, so we're really only applying about 6 dB of compression. In between, we can find a setting that preserves some of the natural decay of the drum, yet still releases fast enough to bring up the reverb tails and make the drums sound more powerful. 
At this point, let's try toggling bypass to compare with the uncompressed drums. Notice how polite and well-mannered the drums sound without compression. While the compressed version has attitude and feels like he's hitting harder, this illustrates just how critical compression is to modern drum sounds. The uncompressed sound evokes a vintage feel, like recordings from the 50s or 60s. But the compression brings us back to the future, or at least to the 1980s. Just like EQ, however, it's important to listen to your compression settings in context. Let's bring in the guitars, bass and keys, and listen to the way they blend with the drums. The kick drum has a soft, pillowy character, which is more obvious when it's trying to fit around the bass guitar. And the snare lacks a bit of presence and impact, tending to sit behind the guitars and keys. This is due to a too fast attack time, which is smashing too much of the initial transients off the drums and robbing the mix of punch and definition. But notice what happens if I increase the attack time a bit. Suddenly the kick drum has lots of punch and the snare has a satisfying crack. But notice that it's also significantly reduced the amount of gain reduction, so our average levels have increased noticeably. And our peak levels are now in danger of clipping. Obviously I need to adjust the makeup gain to compensate. But this makes setting the attack time tricky, as you'll need to adjust the gain every time you adjust the attack. So I'm going to reset the gain knob to zero, and turn auto gain back on. Pro C2's guess is a couple of dB off, so I'll tweak that up manually. And I can now adjust the attack time without any major volume changes. This makes it much easier to hear how the attack time changes the character of the drums, from tight and snappy with very fast settings. To punchy with slightly slower settings. thumpy as we get to the halfway point. The auto makeup gain feature does a great job of keeping average levels consistent as I adjust the attack time up and down. But notice what happens to the peak levels. With the fastest attack settings these are lower than the input and we're reducing the difference between peak and average levels. But if I set the attack time somewhere between 5 and 10 milliseconds instead, we now see the opposite. Peak levels are now higher than the input, when we're increasing the peak to average ratio. In a sense, we have increased the dynamic range of the drums, even though compression is theoretically supposed to do the opposite. But we've done so in a very particular way, which helps to create a consistent impact for each drum hit. Let's once again toggle bypass and compare to the dry signal. And notice the drastic difference in the way the compressed drums punch through the mix. Okay, notice the curvy shape of the release stage on the gain reduction graph. And let's try switching to the classic compressor style instead. This looks very much the same on the graph. But we've lost the punchy attacks that the punch style gave us. I can still shape the attack of the drums using the attack time. But no matter what attack time I dial in, this style doesn't give us those boosted transients that we had with the punch style.
if I switch to the Opto style, however. Those transients are back with a vengeance. But we can clearly see a difference in the shape of the release state. So the body of the drum sounds different if I switch back to the punch style again. Usually there isn't a single correct choice of compression style. They can all be used to control the dynamic range, but each has a subtly different flavour which you can exploit creatively. The punch style might be a good choice if you want a dynamic and punchy drum sound, while the classic style might be a better choice when you want a rounder, softer character. If I switch to the pumping style, however, the differences are more dramatic. Now the initial attacks are pretty fierce, and it can start to sound unnatural, with a choking effect as the gain reduction suddenly clamps down on the body of the drum. And again, we can clearly see a difference in the shape of the release curve with the gain releasing slowly to begin with, then speeding up in the opposite manner to the punch style. This shape helps to create audible pumping as the compressor releases. Listen out for the hi-hats and the way they pump up in level whenever there's a space between the kick and snare, and especially the crash cymbal at the start of this loop. pumping style is designed not to be transparent, which can be useful when you're trying to train your ears to some of the possible negative side effects of compression. If I toggle back to the punch style again, you can hear that the difference is dramatic, and the punch style sounds much more natural. However, now that you've noticed that pumping in the hi-hats and cymbals, Notice that it's not entirely gone with the punch style. The hi-hats still jump out a bit at times. And the crash cymbal still pumps audibly. This is something I'm going to look at in part three. Thanks for watching.